Coming up on KCCI 8 News Close Up, AEA debate, what parents, teachers and administrators say about a new house plan to reform the state system for special education. Swatting crackdown, the cost behind a growing number of fake reports to police and what lawmakers are pitching to stop the trend. And Republicans push for more income tax cuts, the dueling plans to lower Iowa's tax rate and why Democrats say low to middle income Iowans will lose out. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning and welcome to Close Up. I'm KCCI Chief Political Reporter Amanda Rooker. Last Wednesday, parents, teachers and other education experts packed an Iowa House committee room to weigh in on a new plan to reform the state's area education agencies or AEAs. Under the new Iowa House proposal, AEAs would still oversee services for all students with disabilities but school districts would get full control of funding for general education and media services, things AEAs currently provide. Right now, AEAs use that funding to provide a wide range of resources, including curriculum development, lending libraries, and mental health support. School districts could still contract with the AEAs to provide those services, but if schools don't purchase those resources at the start of the year, they would not get them at any point throughout the school year. That includes emergency services like those provided to the Perry School District in the wake of last month's deadly shooting at the high school. AEA teams provided support to students and staff and resources like grief counseling and substitute teachers. But some school districts say they know their students best and they say they could better pr provide more individualized services if they control the funding instead of AEAs. My name is Pam Grono and I'm speaking today as a parent of a child with special needs who is in support of this bill. My son has had an IEP since preschool and while I appreciate the services he receives, there are concerns I have based on my personal experiences. First and most importantly, I am concerned with my son's educational outcomes. He has been significantly behind in math for a couple of years and I do not feel there has been a plan put in place to catch him up. IEP meetings are typically once a year and updates on a child's progress are not given regularly, allowing for a lot of time to be lost. Sadly, we are now debating these essential services because an out-of-state company thinks it knows what's best for Iowans and wants to upend what has been a success. Please don't listen to these special interests. Please listen to the thousands of Iowans and experts involved in serving our students, families, and public schools. While there may be elements of this program we can improve, reinventing the programs and services through private businesses or the Iowa Department of Public Education is not the answer. In less than two years since I've been at Greene County, I've already seen significant achievement gains in both reading and math for our students. However, we have done so at the expense of our own general fund dollars. Of the $800,000 in flow through money, over 150,000 of that it will be divided between media and ed educational services. Simply retaining these funds for our own use would allow us to continue providing high quality professional learning opportunities for our staff, hire support personnel that would help us further develop our MTSS structures, and provide the direct support our teachers need to be successful with the implementation of our science-based reading development. When our teachers are successful. I have served in five different Iowa districts as a special education teacher, a principal, a curriculum director, and a superintendent. In all of these, we use the AEA in many ways with great success. We develop partnerships. I think everyone here already knows that the bill is based on a report from another state by a firm with no expertise in the education world, using flawed data, and with the intent of disseminating the AEAs, so I won't rehash this. But what is important to know is that we have something special in our state. We determine when a child is discrepant and needs extra support, and we do not wait for a disability label for the child to receive services. We have a seamless system for children from birth through 21 to ensure that every child can grow and succeed. And AEA services extend beyond special education through ed and media services to support all educators in our Iowa schools because we serve all children. An earlier version of AEA reform that was proposed by Governor Kim Reynolds would have given school districts full control of special education funding. It also eliminated all funding for general education and media services. Reynolds later amended that proposal to allow AEAs to provide those services, but only if a school district requested it. The Iowa Senate significantly amended Reynolds' plan before they passed it through committee. Under their bill, school districts would receive 90% of special education funding. 
10% of funding would go to their, directly to their local AEA. The Senate bill would also let school districts decide how to spend 60% of state funding for media and education services. Their AEA would be guaranteed at least 40% of that state funding. Both the Senate and House plans shift oversight of AEAs from local boards to the director of the Department of Education. Next on Close Up, state lawmakers push for a crackdown on swatting, why law enforcement hopes it could cut down the growing number of dangerous prank calls. Iowa law enforcement says swatting is a growing problem across the state. That's when a caller makes a false police report, usually about a mass shooting or a bombing, with the intent of getting police or SWAT teams to respond to the scene. That draws resources away from real incidents. According to the Iowa Department of Public Safety, three years ago they investigated four swatting cases. But by last year, that number increased to 39 cases. And just two weeks into this year, 13 school districts across Iowa have already received a swatting call. The Iowa House and Senate both have bills that would increase penalties for people found guilty of making swatting calls. We recently talked to law enforcement about how serious the problem is and if increased punishment will help cut down on the crime. Yeah, the easiest way is talking about like a prank phone call or false information. Somebody calls into a 911 center, says, hey, this activity is going on. We as law enforcement take it as, I mean, to be real. That's something that we're, we're trained to do. We don't know if it's real, not real. We respond to an incident like that. And the swatting side of it is when it's a fake call. It used to be somebody call in to try to get a, a day out of school. Now it's a lot more advanced. I mean, they're going through other countries on phone calls, over the internet, on different things. And our response still has to be the same. And uh, we are seeing an increase in it, and we're very appreciative that the legislators are addressing it. So, I mean, it, it could be a simple call that we send one or two police officers or deputies, or it could be something that we're calling out tactical teams. I mean, uh, there's a lot of times somebody will call and they're, I'm holding my family hostage, I've already killed one person, or we're doing this, and you're, it's a tactical response with tons of resources coming to address that, and the address we're showing up to, they have no knowledge of what's going on. I mean, and so it's, it's very expensive for agencies to deal with it. Well, I think one of the things that a lot of times, whether it be at a private residence, but we see a lot of squ swatting calls now dealing with schools. And, and that's a sensitive topic. I mean, here in home, I mean, in Iowa, Perry, different places, when you have events like that, it's, it's a serious event. And the consequences that go along with it, it, it used to be more of that joking side of things. And we're seeing that, no, this is serious and we want to reduce that. It's a long process. On, on Once it's all said and done and we realize, hey, this person that was at that address had nothing to do with this, we still have to go through and try to figure out and that's subpoenas, it's court orders, it's different things on figuring out where did it come back or it come from, who paid for the account. And so that process is a long process that also takes a lot of time and resources from uh, our offices. I mean, I'm in a rural sheriff's office and you might have one detective that could be working on other important issues that's trying to backtrack information like this because it's also important. 
we know that they take away valuable resources when that happens. Can you kind of talk, talk to us about that? Sure, sure. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but we've seen an increase in these over the years, and they do suck a lot of resources away from real problems. You know, we have, you know, thousands of calls for service a year, and, you know, sometimes 100 or more a day. If we have one swatting call, we are taking a, a massive response to that school, for example, because we, we treat it like it's the real deal until we know it's not. And that requires a r rapid response from a lot of people, and it, it, it will pull those resources away from other emergencies or calls for service that we have. The other thing about it is, you know, it's to be a kid in a school and to look out the window and see a bunch of police officers with guns running towards the door is, is frightening and it's, it's traumatizing. It's, it's not a joke because they may think there's something really going on in that school, just like we do in that moment, and that's gonna stick with them. So the, these swatting calls, not only are they you know, a, a resource suck, they're also you know, a, a traumatizing experience for these young kids in the schools or somebody in an office building or wherever the, the incident may be um, reported. You mentioned you know, there's been an uptick, not just here in Des Moines, right. but across the nation of swatting calls in the last few years. Is there any idea on why that could be? Wow, man, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, it, it's hard to, to determine what motivates someone to falsely report a crime, particularly if they're not here to watch. You know, it's one thing if you would call in a response at your neighbor's house and then sit across the street and watch. It's another thing when we're, you know, getting a call from someplace that indicates it's from another state. So I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think anybody really knows. Well, I think we all could speculate on what their motive might be. Um, who knows if it's really to pull the police away from, you know, what they're doing as a distraction. Uh, we haven't really seen that, but they, if, are they messing with the police or are they messing with the people in the school? I mean, that's a, that's a question that really you don't know. But it's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's traumatizing for the people involved. It can be dangerous because we're trying to get somewhere fast because we think we're in the saving lives mode. And uh, it's, it's definitely something that we need to, to put an end to. But as you heard there, a difficult problem to solve. So lawmakers attempting to fix that are moving two bills through the state house that would increase penalties for anyone convicted of making a swatting call. Right now, swatting is a misdemeanor crime. Under the bills, swatting would become a class D felony that carries a prison sentence of up to five years. But if the swatting call resulted in someone getting hurt, it gets upgraded to a class C felony, which carries a prison sentence of up to 10 years. The Iowa Senate passed the swatting ball last week. An Iowa House committee also passed the bill. It's now waiting for a vote in the full House. Well, still to come on close up accelerated tax cuts. Why Republicans say Iowa can afford to speed up and expand income tax cuts and why Democrats say low and middle income Iowans would not feel that relief.
Welcome back to Close Up. Governor Kim Reynolds says passing more income tax cuts is a top priority this year. Right now, Iowa's current individual income tax rate is 5.7%. Governor Reynolds' bill would reduce that to a flat 3.65% and it would, reply, it would apply retroactively this year. Next year, the income tax would drop again to 3.5%. That speeds up and expands tax cuts that Reynolds passed in 2022. Iowa Senate and House Republicans are also working on their own plan. That would also lower the income tax rate, but it would do so over a longer time frame, and it would work to eventually eliminate Iowa's income tax entirely. Republicans say state government is over-collecting and that these tax cuts would rightfully return the money to Iowa taxpayers. But Democrats say the cuts benefit wealthy Iowans over those in the middle and lower class. Well, the nexus of the conversation is we have three and a half billion dollars in the taxpayer relief fund. In the letter of the law, and that was something that was passed over a decade ago in a bipartisan manner, is that the monies in those funds have to be used for income tax relief. And we have uh, been very responsible in our budgeting, and we have uh, this amount of money there that we never would have predicted. Iowa's economy continues to grow. We continue to cut taxes, which makes the economy perform better. And the question now becomes, how do we use this three and a half billion dollars, essentially? And that's where you see the two plans here before legislature. Uh, the governor, uh, you know, and the nice thing is that we all want to cut taxes, right? So there's no disagreement on that. But how do you use that money? There's different ideas out there. Uh, the governor has, you know, an idea of, you know, cutting the rate, the flat tax rate down to three and a half percent and getting that money back to Iowa taxpayers uh, as soon as possible. From the legislator standpoint, Senator Co or Representative Kaufman and I, we have a you know different plan. Like maybe we don't need to return that money all back at once. Maybe instead of looking at that same money, maybe we grow that pot just like Iowa businesses do. Whenever they earn money, they reinvest back in their business to grow their business. Iowa families, when they want to save for their retirement, they save up a little bit more and watch that money grow in their 401k. And that's kind of what we're proposing here from a legislative standpoint, as opposed to when do we return that money back? Why don't we grow that pot? to the purpose of eventually eliminating the Iowa income tax. Well, I think the best way is to elevate the discussion for all Iowans to kind of see the differences and where there might be some similarities. And by doing that, so we just today, we moved the governor's plan out of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, and we will attach a fiscal note to it to show what that plan cost. In the coming weeks, uh, Representative Kaufman and I, we are going to be moving our income tax bill out to put a fiscal note along that as well and kind of really show Iowans what the cost is and what the opportunities are and get people to weigh in. I think the constituents as well as this up here, you, you know, uh, a lot of people are still trying to understand the difference between the two plans. Uh, you know, three and a half billion dollar, it's a good problem to have, you know, and so we just, we gotta be thoughtful about it and make sure with this one time money, we do the best thing we can. I just don't think the property tax, I mean, we passed the largest property tax reform in Iowa history last year. And the Iowa legislature has no intent of undoing those gains and shifting back to a property tax funded tax system, right? So I, I just uh, wholeheartedly disregard that particular uh, criticism. When it comes to terms of the income tax and why Chairman Kaufman and I want to eliminate the income tax, we have all these different groups out there that already don't pay income taxes or they get a special break compared to others. And if we have this uneven income tax system, why not just get rid of it and make our entire tax system more fair for all Iowans? And that's kind of the, the crux of where we're coming at this entire discussion, right? Uh, like they said, if you have the means, you have an ability to get out of paying income tax, and some people just don't in the end. And essentially, the income tax is a bigger burden on middle class Iowans than anyone else. And that's what we're really trying to do is make the system more fair for all Iowans. That's the beauty of our plan, right? We're not proposing to raise the sales tax in our state. Like over in Nebraska, there's a plan right now to raise the sales tax 2%. We're just taking the money we have and growing it and using those returns to buy down the rate. Uh, so that's why I said, I Iowans aren't gonna see a massive tax shift one way or the other. We're just doing something innovative here in Iowa that hasn't been tried in other states and just treat it like anything else. And that's why we're using the most trusted name in the state, IPERS, to help manage and grow this money and use those returns to eliminate well, Obviously there are some different options floating around today. Uh, committee advanced the governor's tax proposal. You know, you expressed some concerns about this potentially impacting the way that government is funded in the future, but just tell me a little bit, you know, what are some of your concerns about the income tax reform proposal at the governor? Well, 
first of all, the, the Republicans themselves are still in negotiations. They have not reached agreement among themselves what kind of tax bill they want to see this coming legislative session. But what I can tell you is that the bill that is before, the governor's bill that was before us this morning actually will, will start shifting taxes to sales tax and property taxes in order to fund essential government services like educating our children, like public safety, like all the things that Iowans really have come to depend on. So that is, of course, a very regressive tax to shift that from an income tax system to a sales tax system. Um, we also know that we are right now phasing, phasing in a new tax system. And we know that by year three, January 26, that income tax changes will reduce the revenues in our state by almost $2 billion, about 20% of our budget. So this is just really, truly shifting the taxes to um, sales and property. Obviously, Republicans' argument is looking at the budget surplus and looking at the surplus in the taxpayer relief fund and saying, this, this shows we're over-collecting and we need to lower taxes. You know, what's your response to that argument? There's a couple reasons why we have a surplus. Number one, at least $11 billion just came into the state government for, from the federal pandemic relief dollars. About $2.5 billion of that hasn't even been used yet or spent on what it was sent to Iowa to spend it on. The second thing is, is that over the last several years, Iowa has truly, the, the Republicans have truly underfunded um, edu uh, 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 funding our education system in Iowa, our public health departments in Iowa, and so that's what's causing this uh, uh, huge surplus to emerge in Iowa, simply not providing the level of funding we need to educate kids from early childhood through higher education, and of course, uh, uh, again, it was a lot of federal pandemic dollars as well. Well, them, um, again, when you're replacing a very uh, the fair tax system that we have now that supports our schools and public safety um, and you replace it with sales tax to fund those services, that hits the working class harder than anyone and of course the working poor. Um, so no, that, that is just simply not the way to fund state government and, and I will never change my mind on that as I have been around long enough to know uh, what it takes to make all of this work and how to be a more fair and balanced tax system where every Iowan pays their fair share. I can tell you that right now there's 3,400 Iowans who earn more than a million dollars a year and they are the biggest beneficiaries of this current tax uh, cut that's, that is now being phased in. It's wrong. The people who need it most are those who are earning $60,000 a year or less, and they will see little or nothing from this tax cut that is currently being phased in. This is Still to come on Close Up, State House protests from both the ground and the air. Why state union workers are upset.
Last week, a caravan of cars and trucks surrounded the Iowa State House. A plane even circled flying a banner in protest of a new Senate bill. It would put new requirements on public unions and their employers. Senate File 2374 would decertify unions for public employees if their employer doesn't send a list of its members to the state. KCCI's Kayla James spoke with the union about why they say this bill would hurt Iowa workers. And you know, for 50 years there's been this bond between public servants in Iowa and public employers uh, to keep our schools running, keep our streets running, keep our snow plowed. And uh, they're breaking that trust again. And uh, we're here to, to alert the public that uh, what they're doing is going to have detrimental effects to, to the general population. And you know, we've got a report of a small public works department who 18 times in the last year has answered the call in the middle of the night to keep the water running in the small town and keep sewage from backing up in people's houses. They're not getting paid to answer their phone in the middle of the night. They're not obligated to answer their phone in the middle of the night. Next time sewage backs up in small towns, they should call Senator Dickey and not the public servants that he's attacking. We spoke about this earlier. How many people do you guys have out here today? How many vehicles? We had about 100 vehicles uh, and, an, and an airplane pulling a banner that says uh, kill Senator Dickey's union busting bill and a couple semis. What are you hoping, you know, people understand from this caravan? What, what are you hoping? Well, we're just sounding the alarm that Senator Dickey and Senator Schultz are attacking public sector workers once again. And these are teachers. These are school bus drivers. These are first responders, law enforcement, it's firefighters, it's people who drive our kids to school on school buses, it's people who keep water running into our homes and sewage running out of our homes, and these are the people that they're attacking. And you heard him mention Republican Senator Adrian Dickey there. He's leading the bill. He says he's being, quote, attacked for simply proposing public employers and unions follow the law. Dickey says the bill is nothing more than a technical cleanup and that, quote, if the public sector, employers and the union are following the law, nothing will change for them. Well, thanks for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Have a great day.